We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata. Mike, what's up? <sighs> Short work week. It's nice. Off the five-day weekend. Slow start. Slow start for my actual work. You know, it's just five days off. And I feel like as I'm trying to get going, it's like, oh, I forgot that. And I'd leave the house. Mm -hmm. And as I sat down in my car, I went, I forgot that too. And I'd have to <laughs> get out, unlock the door, come inside, grab it, get out, lock the door. Wasn't on time, but how how was your day so far? This is my first day back at work since Thursday last week. Crazy. You know. Friday, Thursday, Thursday. Not a whole lot can live up to Friday night with Taylor Swift. Oh, right. Yeah, you have the much more exciting. It was everything that you could possibly think of. What's cool about it, I've said it before. Obviously, it's awesome that they're the money, Hamilton County and the Cincinnati Bengals are going to split some of that money and that revenue, and that's going to go to great things. Uh, but just seeing a stadium that you go watch football games at get so loud for a performer, I would say she's a superstar. I think you can call Taylor Swift a superstar. I promise we're going to move on to football talk soon. Uh, but it was it was really cool. Um, stadium concerts, I know people love and hate them. But for me personally, I'm team cheap, so I'm never going to pay to sit in the front row of a stadium or a concert. So I'm like, cool. I'll just watch her on the video board. I am guilty of watching Bengals games, sitting close to the field and watching the Bengals games on the video board versus the field. Oh, no, no way. Uh, but it does sound great. Uh, I, I'm always, even if I am in the 300s, I'm watching the field. I'll watch the video board for replays, but I'm watching the field. Uh, just, I don't know. That's, that's how I, that's how I want to see the game. But the one, a couple questions. Yeah. Before we move on, yeah. was Joe Burrow there? I assume not. It would have been on social media. I don't think he was. Um, I didn't see him, but I feel like the Bengals would have posted something with Joe there. But no. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. Probably not. Other one is just, uh, yeah, I've done two stadium concerts before. I thought they were both good. Uh, I live in the Pittsburgh area. Neither yeah. one has been Heinz or Akrisher Stadium. So uh, I'm going to avoid that one, but I went to one at PNC Park and one at PPG Paints Arena, which is the only time I've been to PPG. That's their hockey rink, which is pretty cool. But PNC Park's my favorite because there's a there's a nice brewery right here where I like to get my seats. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, it was cool. You know, speaking of a good time, Joe Burrow. Didn't see him at the concert, so I don't know if he won. I don't want to confirm or deny, but I, I didn't see him, and I feel like we would have known. There was a huge party, 4th of July party. I want to talk about this Michael Rubin guy, the CEO of Fanatics, which I'm sure he has a great income coming in with Fanatics. Um, great idea for sports fans. Good for him. He seems to know a lot of people uh, because he has the Super Bowl party, and then he had the 4th of July party, but Joe Burrow was there. And, yeah, there were a few sprinkled in NFL athletes, but – some big name people, and you, they had Jay Z, Beyonce, uh, Tom Brady. Joe Burrow was with Tom Brady doing a toast for something, uh, right next to him in a photo. He's with uh, D Book, Devin Booker, which is pretty cool. A lot of other NBA and or NBA NFL actors. Ben Affleck was there. It just seems like uh, Joe Burrow was in really great company this weekend. Did you see anything about that Fourth of July party? Yeah, I saw Kevin Durant and. Kevin Durant's always funny because he's like seven feet tall. So uh, if you get a picture next to him, even though Joe Burrow is like six foot four, he looks mm -hmm. small. Also, NBA players in general just make you look small. Like Devin Booker and there's another one with Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. You took pictures of both of them and like they're the same height as him. But if you watch an NBA game, like they're, they're the shorter ones on the court. It's just a reminder of like, man, everybody on the NBA court is a giant. Anybody who's like a normal person size looks so small. Uh, but yeah, I mean, cool. I don't look the white thing. Mm -hmm. It felt a little culty. It felt a little bit like a cult. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, I'm not in these circles. So maybe, <laughs> maybe it makes it sense. Big time money in those circles. It looks pretty cool. But my first thought was like, man, this looks like a cult. Like if you just show me a bunch of these pictures and like, I didn't know the people, I'd be like, this is a cult. I, I don't know what to tell you. Get out, Joe, get out. But all the famous people are there, so uh, I would assume not a cult. Um, too bad. <sighs> Who would you want to see him get a picture with? Because the first two that came to mind were LeBron and Shaq, just still thinking of NBA. Although I guess probably NFL guys, there's some out there. 
not 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 defensive guys. I feel like you know they've got it in for him. I don't want to see him with Aaron Donald, even though he's great. Or uh, Parsons, he was there too. I'm like, no, oh, Parsons was there. Yeah, I'm you know it's a little too close. It, it's close to home from that week two matchup versus the Dallas Cowboys. I think they could uh, sit that one out. Um, out of everyone who I'd want him to get a photo with, hmm, that's a really good question because every single time I see a video or a photo, it's a different person at the party. I think, you know, out of all the people, I think obviously Joe Burrow is going to be hanging around these circles and a lot of these NBA athletes, actors, they're going to see each other at events and they were all just at the Super Bowl together too. But to see Jay-Z walk in and Beyonce, I'd be like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Picture with Beyonce would be, I mean, be pretty, pretty, pretty good for the, for the gram of it all. Maybe there's, you know, maybe he doesn't want them. Maybe it was mostly athletes. He took pictures with all yeah. athletes. I mean, it's mostly I, athletes there though. Cause it's fanatics, right? Yeah. I saw Des Bryant say, uh, I think he said it was his boys and Joe Burrow was in the photo. So, oh, cool. you know, a lot of really, a lot of really cool things. Even the vets, superstars who were there, you know, NBA players, Joe put it on his Instagram of like, you know, probably talking a lot of basketball and football when you're around these guys. And most of the photos were with NBA players. Kevin Durant was in the photo. Devin Booker, mm -hmm. Donovan Mitchell was in one of them. If you could think of the NBA players, that were at the 4th of July party. Okay. Who would make the best teammate on this NFL team? Because I feel like if you're an athlete, you can play pretty much every sport. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I believe that NBA player can just be like, yep, I'm going to be a tight end. Yep, I'm going to be okay. a wide Play player. any sport, I agree. I don't know if an NBA player could just go like, yeah, I'm just going to go play Maybe I NFL that, football. Because the NFL is hard. The NFL is hard. Yeah. That that's, that isn't fair to NFL players. They shouldn't But like if they put their mind to it in high school, they yes. yeah, probably could have gone to college, maybe D1. Most of them would probably go D1 in football or whatever they try to do. Yep. So. I agree with you, but I also don't agree that like Kevin Durant could go you like, you know what? On. I want to take a little more contact. <laughs> Actually, Kevin Durant's probably too tall. Like, think of any guys that are seven feet in the NFL. I, I mean, anybody? But because it's not – you lose leverage when you're um, – if you're going to play on the line, you got no leverage. That's why you don't see guys that are above like six, 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 seven, six, eight maybe. A lot of those guys, they can't get down. But I, I just imagine Kevin Durant against one of the corners in the in the NFL, just putting his hands up, and he gets it over like dunks on him, just dunks on him. No jump ball needed. Yeah, Kevin, wide receiver, just put him out there. I think Devin Booker would be good in the in the NFL. I was trying to look up. I'm gonna look up height, weight, just on the two guards because I think mm -hmm. the answer would be Devin Booker or Donovan Mitchell. Mitchell's six one two fifteen. That's actually. Really not bad size. That's not bad. He's pretty thick. He well, Booker. it's funny because Joe has talked about it before. Uh, you know, when when picking sports because he's very athletic. He was actually really good at basketball and making yeah. that decision to say kind of focus on football and and having that be a career where he could have possibly okay. chose the NBA. Booker is six five two oh six. So, look, I know the height's appealing. I'm a Cavs fan, so that's also part of it. I think I go Donovan Mitchell though, just because he's so thick. Like that is a thing though, because NBA player you can get away with being that thin, right? You could be. I guess there are receivers who have been like six foot five ish, two hundred five ish, yeah. but six one two oh five two ten or what is, was it six? I'm gonna look it up again real quick. Six one. Okay, don't fail me now, internet. Six one two fifteen. That's thick. That's thick. That's that's. That's about Jamar Chase. Like, I think a, an inch taller, but similar weight. I take that. I, I just – I want them to be a little bit thicker. Like, Shaq, if he was a little shorter, could have been a really dominant NFL player. I just think he might have been too tall. Whatever he wanted. <laughs> O-line, D-line, whichever one he liked more. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. I like the Donovan Mitchell thickness. I think he's also very aggressive. Now, if there was ever – an NBA player that should have been in the NFL to me, it was Russell Westbrook. Really? You know what? Oh, he would hop around to so many different teams. 
I don't even care about that. He's just got the maniac mentality, tries to dunk on everybody, just flies in, doesn't care about contact. I just think the contact and the ability to absorb hits is going to be your biggest difference between NFL and NBA. But anyway, who do you think? I feel like you're going Booker on this yeah, thing. Yeah, I would go Although, Booker. You did mention Durant. Durant, very tall. I just think might be too tall. He, he actually commented on Joe's Instagram and he said, look, I'm not going on the middle of the field. I'm just not. <laughs> yeah, that too. Not going to happen because uh, that would be absolutely terrible for him. But uh, yeah, I, honestly, yeah, I would put him as a wide receiver. Maybe a little bit of a cornerback. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, so tall. Why are there not that many tall corners, though? Is it? No, I don't. Is it? A real issue with that or is it just like you get that tall and they're like go to wide receiver we'll figure this out <laughs> could you think of any you know even if you could go to the people at the fourth of july party that were around joe who who is chatting with or, or just in general when you think of nba and, and that nfl conversation who would make the best quarterback current oh, NBA the best player? quarterback current nba player yeah i have I an guess. answer for a guy that wasn't there but ah uh, I, I think Booker. I think Booker would be the better quarterback, but I think I'd want Mitchell more to catch passes and take hits. So I guess Booker out of the guys that were there, guys that weren't there, Kevin Love. You ever seen him throw outlet passes? He throws it like a football. I think he would. He, you know what? he does. Very, very tall though. Very Hail Mary, tall. Kevin Love. It's coming. Yeah, down. <laughs> that's what he did. Like when in his prime, at least. I don't know. Maybe he's too old now. But in his prime, on those Cavs and those Timberwolves, he would just cock it back and fire the thing the whole way down the court. It was usually pretty accurate. So uh, that is my quarterback out of any NBA player still playing. He was in the finals with the heat, but he's on the, he's on the tail end of the career. He definitely is. And I would go and he, I don't think he was there, but look, every single time I'm on Instagram, a new person is posting a photo at this party, but I would say it would be, you're not going to like this because you are a Cavs fan, but I will go. Who do you think I'm going to say? Uh, with that comment, Curry, mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, I think it's fine. I just think it's different between shooting the ball and throwing the ball. Steph Curry would remind me of Joe Burrow. Oh, that quiet confidence, maybe not quiet, is it? I mean, I, I, don't, I feel like Joe has a lot of confidence in the quarterback position, and I feel like Steph Curry would do the same thing, he'd be a great leader. Um, I think it, I don't know, I just think that. Steph, how tall is he? I don't even know. Oh, he's six foot two. That's fine. It was the 185 that got me. I was Ooh. like, oh, that is. <laughs> he's going to get crushed. <laughs> he's just going to get snapped in half. He's going to have to put on about 15 to 20 pounds, but he will make a good quarterback. I mean, the Warriors guy that could play football is the one that sometimes plays football on the court, Draymond Green. <laughs> That'd be the. Did you, see, did you see what Draymond said recently? No. Uh, there is so. the celebrity. Oh, uh, it was the Joe Burrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three, oh one, God. three. Against, uh, yeah, yeah. Stop with the three, one. You guys got sent home by Joey B. Yeah. Uh, Draymond, six, six, two, thirty. Yeah, I could find a place for him on the NFL field. Maybe put on twenty pounds. I don't know. This was a long talk. Of, it was. It was. You no. know, like, if you're listening to this episode, you probably know we're about three weeks away from training camp. We will get to our player profile in the next segment. We're gonna do a heavy defense. Tomorrow is going to be the mailbag day, but we really, you know, big 4th of July people. But and tweet tweet at us and uh, tell us if we missed any NBA players you think would be NFL players or you'd want on the Bengals or anything of the sort. I don't know. That I, I thought it was a fun idea. It, was fun. It, went, it went fast. It went fast. Hey, look, we could be breaking down the number of what the contract's going to look like. We don't know. It's all coming soon. We'll, we'll find out what that looks like. But there's one more thing I want to say about the 4th of July. Jamar Chase. Please. Get away from the fireworks? Yes. <laughs> Get away from the fireworks. I mean, look, we, we we anything could happen. There's firework incidents all the time. I see, I look on Instagram this morning, go to the, the little stories, and I'm like, oh, Jamar Chase. Let's see what Jamar Chase did on the 4th of July. Lighting fireworks a little too close for home. So a little too close to home. So I just want him to play it safe. Maybe in the contract extension next year, they put it in there. You <laughs> fireworks. can't light fireworks at all. You can watch them. Makes me a little nervous. Okay. Maybe if he has one of those like cartoon, like really long uh, pieces that light and it just starts like going 10 feet away. Maybe the snappers you could do like on the ground. They snap. <laughs> yeah. Do those. Sure. Do those. The sparklers. sparklers. That's it. 
no more. I, it, it absolutely terrifying to see NFL or just people in general with fireworks. So, oh man, uh, yeah, uh, my neighborhood loves fireworks. I'm glad they're not shooting them today as well. But yeah, they were there on the Fourth of July from. Well, I wasn't home, but basically when I got home, which was like seven mm -hmm. until one in the morning, and I don't even understand at, at like seven p.m. Like the sun is still bright and out there. The sun doesn't set till 9 p.m. past that. I tried to walk my dog and somebody set off a grand finale <laughs> just filled with smoke. The dog was not happy. It wasn't a great experience. I am pro firework on the 4th of July, but my take would be the sun's got to set. Like let people, you know, kind of do their thing. Uh, at least if you're going to launch like real, like a bunch of real fireworks, like bottle rockets, whatever, I don't really care about and the snappers and the firecrackers. Those are all fine. But if you're going to launch like the giant ones into the air and they're exploding, it's like, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> you just stare up into the sun. Uh, that was my rant. I was just mad because my dog got, uh, he didn't like it. Yeah, no, I feel bad for anybody that has a, a dog at home because the 4th of July. He actually doesn't is really care too much about fireworks either it was just that we were right next to him but like when they're going off lucky bless that he does not have those world those war flashbacks and start screaming uh he's he just doesn't really care it's just that we were so close to them that i think it hurt his ears well but that's... yeah most most dogs i think that's the that's been the real issue with the fireworks well, I just feel really proud of our 4th of July segment. And um, as we move on to July 6th, it's almost time. When when J July 4th gets here, it just reminds me that football season's almost here, pretty much. That's like the biggest thing. All oh, football's down. Football's a month from, you know, we're going to see real, not real football, but kind of fake football in about a month. And that's big to me, and I'm, I'm ready for it. So, yeah, fiance's birthday is August 5th. Uh, 15th <laughs> i'm sorry my best friend's birthday i uh, messed it up on air live on air august 15th i said august 5th anyway fiance's birthday is august 15th my best friend's birthday is august 5th so that's i you know i wish one was like had a different number in there but um that's how i know it's getting close to football i'm like oh shoot it's august huh <laughs> I, I was born in August too. So I was Oh, sure. okay, great. I saw my mom. I was like, I was ready for football season. That's why I was born yeah. in August. You know, right. it's funny. Um, but yeah, we have plenty more. Cam Taylor Bray, player profile. Again, send your tweets over. We're gonna send out a question uh later today when you are listening to this podcast for a double header mailbag. You can follow Mike Bengals underscore sands. You can follow me at Ellen DS Patterson. We will be back next on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Going to talk a little Cam Taylor Britt. You know, didn't put it out there on the social media world. And I thought, let's do Cam Taylor Britt. He's one of my favorites going into this year. Year two uh, really stepped up in his rookie season. We didn't know what the cornerback room was going to look like when Cheeto went down. And I was just really surprised seeing Eli Apple, Cam Taylor Britt out there in the secondary. And maybe what Cam Taylor Britt and Cheeto will look like going into 2023, 2024 four season i say 2024 because they play in january so look i'm cheating a little bit but let's go to the player profile cam taylor Britt. tell me everything we should know about him going into year two and you can even back it up to his rookie year yeah um so i think cam taylor Britt was interesting late second round pick you i think typically don't expect those guys to start uh and he didn't start right away to be fair I liked him coming out of college. I did think there was a little bit of a project there. He's a pretty beefy corner and he is not afraid of getting involved in the run game. He also had the injury. I think that also is something we didn't talk about that much, but I do remember when it was preseason, I was excited to watch, to watch him along with Dax Hill and all these other rookies. And uh, was it, was it a kickoff or something? Cause he was, I thought he was supposed to play. And then I think he might have gotten hurt right before. Maybe it was in training camp. It was, I think it was in training camp, but I just remember okay. thinking the injury happened and we're probably not going to see Cam Taylor Britt as rookie year. That's what yeah. I thought. Well, I didn't know about rookie year, but <laughs> I definitely was disappointed. I was like, oh, yeah. and then you hit the pup list and didn't play for weeks, but you went 60th overall. I usually think in my mind, top 50 picks could be guys that you might count on to start year one. And then after that, you're looking at guys you're going to count on to start in like year two. But once he was given the starting job, which was against Cleveland, 
he actually took over a bit in that Atlanta game, but it was a little bit of a blowout. But I do think it was also because at halftime, if you remember, uh, Eli Apple gave up a giant, I can't remember if it was caught, big play. I think it was caught. Big play. Yep, it was his his bad in quarters. It was he's supposed to take his guy vertical, didn't take him, he didn't have help from the safety, and huge play. And then Cam Taylor Britt starting. And if Cheeto doesn't get hurt, I wonder if that's you know the whole thing. But Cheeto ends up getting hurt, and we don't think about did he take Eli Apple's job or not because they both had to start. But and just for reference, I finally loaded it up. The guys that are picked around Cam Taylor Britt are like. Well, I mean, some of these guys are starters, but Luke Gadecki, Troy Anderson, Ed Ingram, Drake Jackson, Brian Cook, James Cook, Nick Benito. You know, like, I think you hear those names, you don't think, like, oh, you got to start that guy year one. So, I mean, the Bengals found a year one starter at that spot. I think that's already good. Um, What he does well is he's just really physical. He'll jam guys. He gets into them. Uh, he's not afraid of contact. He gets involved in the run game. Sometimes he's a little too eager, and that's something that he can improve for next year. Is I think he, he you know, he, he gets excited seeing the run come his way and wants to make that play quick. But you have to maintain gap integrity and stay on the outside, hold, contain, uh, and also just make sure you keep your eyes up, making the tackle, everything like that. But I thought he played well. I, he played better than I expected. Um. I think the interesting thing was what zero interceptions in the regular season and only six passes broken up, which is fine. I don't think it's a bad number. I think it's fine. But, you know, stats with corners are like, it's hard (laughs) because are they just not throwing to them or, you know, are they throwing to them? The guy's catching the ball and we do have that is tracked anymore. You know, the, catches given up but that becomes so subjective when you play a lot of zone coverage it's like well did he give that up or was that you know what the coverage was giving up so i don't even like really using that either but i want to see a little bit more ball production interceptions he had an interception in the playoff game against the bills uh i want to see a few a few more uh that would be the one thing i'd look at i want to see him be a little bit more patient i think he's already a solid starting corner and I think he has the potential to get better. Does he have the potential to become, you know, like the next Jalen Ramsey? I don't know. Just because I thought he was a little stiff. Yeah, I still think he looks a little bit stiff out there. But I do think, man, I mean, he's got the mentality and he's got – already has good athleticism. He does a great job when he's jammed up on guys. Does He's a smart zone player. I just think there's a lot to like. I, I think it's a high floor. The ceiling, who knows? I, I think it's more likely than not he's really a good but not elite corner for his career. Maybe he can get there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not ruling it out. I just think when, if I'm looking at the history of guys that are kind of stiff like him, I, I'm not loving that option. But wouldn't wouldn't be completely shocked if that happens. I think he's a good quarter. I think the Bengals found somebody with uh, their with the 60th overall pick. They traded up, so you, you had to feel confident about it because um, they rarely ever trade up. But, yeah, I, all that said is just basically I think he's a good corner. I think mm-hmm. at least solid right now. He has a chance to become good and maybe even very good. I don't know if he ever hits the great elite tier, but I think they already have hit basically a double with that second round pick if he doesn't get any better than right now it's like yeah finding a guy outside the top 50 that's going to be a long-term starter that's great that's awesome uh if he can be a plus long-term starter even better so i think that's already a good it's trending towards already being a good draft pick it could be even better um i think he's got a few things he can clean up and get better the potential is there to ascend into a plus starter in my mind where he might be more like, you know, just solid riding by. He's not bad. He's not the best right now, but that's a rookie year. And I think for a corner specifically corners to me is that's kind of a position where I don't always expect a rookie to come in and play well. And sometimes that actually 
I feel like hurts their psyche. You think of like the Jeff Okudas. Was it really his talent that failed him in Detroit? Or was it getting sent out there against Devontae Adams like week one? And, you know, Devontae Adams does that to a lot of guys, but he does it to you. And how do you bounce back? And then getting hurt and all that other stuff with him. But just specifically, it's just a lot of corners go out there and they don't they don't play too well their rookie season. So to have a guy come out and play pretty well, I think at a solid starting level, his rookie season, there's reason to be excited. And yeah, big physical. I like those types that like to, you know, get into guys and jam and get involved in the run game. And he was a maniac with it in Nebraska. Uh, They used to have him take on tight ends and go make stops in the run game. It was great. And I think that's a big reason why the coaching staff and the Bengals love him is his willingness to do the dirty work. But he fits the Bengals culture. They love those corners that can tackle. They like guys that are going to, you know, they're not going to turn their nose up at stopping Derrick Henry. They're going to say like, that's a challenge. And I want to do that. I want to go make that play and go try to tackle Derrick Henry, go try to tackle Nick Chubb, all these guys. They want good tacklers. And I think that's a big part of defense, even though it's really simple, but finding guys that can consistently tackle like that is great and want to do it. I think that's huge. He can lay some big hits. Uh, I just think he's an interesting corner. I compared him to Trey Waynes coming out, and I got a lot of heat because people did not like Trey Waynes. Um, but I think Minnesota Trey Waynes is kind of what you're looking for, right? A big, you know, physical corner. Does a lot in the run game for you. The coaches are going to love him. He's a little stiff. and uh, Still a solid to good coverage player, though. Like, he's still not a bad coverage guy just by being a little stiff. I And he's probably has – well, he definitely does. He has the potential to be better than Trey Waynes. That's just when I think comparison, I usually think like, what is the mid-level, like he comes in, like what, if he doesn't smash what I think he's going to do, but he doesn't disappoint for what you think he's going to do, what would be the comparison in the NFL is what I think of. And sometimes I think people are really optimistic with their comparisons when like a guy who's going in round four is getting the Denzel Ward comparison. It's like, well, Probably not, right? Like somebody would have taken him earlier. <laughs> but second round, Trey Waynes makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know. Uh, anyway, long ramble. What are your thoughts on was, Sam Taylor Britt? It was fantastic. And I think a lot of people needed to hear that. There was a, there were a couple things you, you brought up. And the Bengals, they normally don't trade up. And the funny thing about it is how full circle they traded up. I want to stay with the Bills. That was the team they traded with to get Cam Taylor Britt. And Cam Taylor Britt was able to get that interception in the divisional round game against the Bills in his rookie year. So I thought that was kind of cool. Also, yes, when it comes to rookie cornerbacks, you look around the league there, it's hard to be a cornerback in the NFL. I would say it's the hardest position in the NFL. That might be a hot take, but it, but it's extremely hard to play. Um, Louis quarterback, Aruba, probably number one. Well, yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's like a different sport though. Like they, they're, they're playing a different sport corner as the uh, hardest uh yeah, after offensive line, sure. I mean, you think about how hard it is to play corner in the league now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I agree. I think a lot of the – anything coverage defensively. Yep. Linebacker might be the hardest, though, just because you have to do, like, everything. I don't know. I'm thinking a lot think right of, now. Think of, uh, think of just a cornerback play, making a football play, and mm-hmm. it's like, oh, flag, flag. Especially wide receivers. that They get the flag all the time. Yep for just jumping right into the corner or like an underthrown ball, you're in good position. He just looks back, he just jumps through him, flails yeah. the arms, and yeah, <laughs> then the flag's coming out. It stinks. I think it's, Playing corner I think stinks. To play. Well, and you mentioned uh, rookie corners. And we mm-hmm. remember, I remember early on, I wish I had the quote in front of me right now from Lou Inarumo when he was talking about Cam Taylor Bray. He didn't want to push him out there. That was kind of be the biggest thing. I mean, I'm sure if in a perfect world – Cheeto's going to be healthy the full season. And there were talks Eli Apple right before that, like, Ooh, is Cam Taylor Britt going to replace Eli Apple? What's that going to look like? And then the injury happened, unfortunately in October for Cheeto and you have to have Cam Taylor Britt start. But I remember Lou was asked about that. He, he remembered Xavier Howard and he didn't want to put him in a position where your rookie year, you're still learning a lot of things you can learn on the sideline. And I know the Dax Hill conversation too, you can kind of, um, you know, mix the two, but there wasn't a spot for Dax Hill to play in his rookie year. You wanted those guys to stay healthy in the safety position. Um, but overall, I think that benefited him, you know, how much he probably learned in his rookie year when he had to step up and be a starting cornerback to going into this off season and what that looks like in year two. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think expectations, You do you think expectations should be high? 
I think um, what defines high? I would say. My expectations are he improves and becomes a plus starter, which I guess is fairly high, right? Yeah. But I, I guess it, are you, it, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't have an expectation of Pro Bowl All Pro this year. You know, no. Second year corner. No, 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 no. Yeah. No. Like, uh, what, what constitutes high is like, you know, like I feel like you're allowed to be high on him, but then also there's probably fans out there that hear that and go like, "Woo wee, we got an all pro." You know, <laughs> leads the team in interceptions. Oh, <sighs> interesting. I almost, I don't know if you can expect that though. My, my, who would be your odds-on favorite? And we're nearing the end of the segment. Who would be your odds-on favorite to lead the team in interceptions? Logan Wilson. I know. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that should be the expectation, right? At <laughs> least the DBs and interceptions, maybe. I mean, there's one thing I, I hope that they work. And again, they're all working really hard. I know it. I know. And the defense is always fun to watch in training camp because we are three weeks away from hearing that this defense is legit and the offense has problems. Um, we are three weeks away from those storylines of what the defense looks like in training camp because we've seen it two years in a row. Um, but I think with Cam Taylor Britt and just the defense alone, can can they just hang on to the ball? Just hang on to it. There's so many plays that you go back to even last year and they have it. They have the ball in their hands to make the play and then draw. Yeah. That's yeah. been the gotta answer. catch it. Just gotta yeah. gotta catch the ball. So so yeah, that's that's where I, I mean I I if he had a similar year to this as his rookie year, would that be a, like a down year? Would that be a downer um, for you? Hmm. Slightly. Just it wouldn't make me upset, and I I I wouldn't even think like, oh man, I don't know if this guy's going to be a starter on the team long term or anything. Because I think he's if he plays at that level, that is about a long term starter. But just because I think a, he should get better. I would be hoping for it. Now, progression is not always linear either. Like he could stagnate this year and then year three, he comes out and he's really good or something mm -hmm. like that. Think of like Josh Allen. It wasn't year one, bad year two, pretty good year three, great year four, all-star. It was like year one, bad year two, bad year three, pretty bad. <laughs> and then yeah. just boom, jump. <laughs> I don't remember if it was year three, or year four, but just the jump. It wasn't, it was too, there's at least two years in a row that he was not very good and then just quick jump. Brandon Ayuk, something similar. Because uh, I had him in fantasy two years ago and he got benched. <laughs> I was like, well, so he's like pretty good his rookie year and then got benched his second year. And now he's back to being a thousand plus yard receiver. I'm trying to think of Bengal examples that kind of did that, but none came to my mind right away. Um, but yeah, well, Andre Smith, he started out. I don't think it was year two that he got better. I think it was like year one, not good. Year two, not good. But he eventually. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of not goods. He eventually jumped though. And he was at least a solid starter for a couple of years. Credit to him. He got a lot of money in the NFL while he was playing. <laughs> he was, he was fine too. I thought he was, I mean, I thought he was solid. He said his career was pretty lengthy. Um, you know, I feel, it feels like he played for 20 years, but. Uh, well, that's because the Bengals kept bringing him back to come play. They had him play left tackle. It would be August. Andre Smith signed with the Cincinnati Bengals again. Andre Smith was released from the Cincinnati Bengals. So yeah, it was, <laughs> it was just never ending. Classic. Um, but yeah, Cam Taylor Bray. I, I'm pumped to see what he looks like. Um, and then it just seemed really exciting with Cheeto. I don't think they're going to push him, but hey, if he's ready in September, could see Cheeto and Cam Taylor Bray out there, and we'll see how they uh, they play with each other on the defensive side of the ball. I want to stay with the secondary next and the defensive side. And of course, Lou and Arumo on it's always game day in Cincinnati. We are back on it's always game day in Cincinnati. We talked to a little Cam Taylor Britt. We can stay with the secondary right now. What are some more expectations for the cornerback room? Some of these rookie guys who could be, starting in September or October, getting some reps. We still don't know what Nick Scott's going to look like as a safety. What are your expectations for the defense right now? <sighs> I think I've said it a few times is that I expect the defense to early on have some issues. And that doesn't mean they're going to be bad. That just means there's going to be a couple busts, just a couple busts and two guys looking at each other, not sure what happened, whether it's a corner and that could even be Cheeto. Mm -hmm. Just both safeties are new. 
I think that's the big part of it. Even though all three corners have experience with each other and the linebackers stay the same, two new safeties makes it a little bit difficult. You know, one safety makes a call or the other one doesn't get it or just something like that. So I think you can see some bust early on. What I'm hoping for is week, let's say the bye week, post bye week, they play just below the level that the Bengals DBs were playing at last year. That's what I'm hoping for is some, I mean, I think the Bengals defensive backs were really good last year. At least I think you can make the argument post by it's not unrealistic that they're better than last year, just because Cheeto was hurt. And if Cheeto can get back to form, that's a weapon they didn't have last year. And you're hoping Cam Taylor Britt's a little bit better, like we just talked about all last segment. And then Mike Hilton, I feel like I'm expecting the same level of play from him. I'm not expecting a drop off. And then the safeties of the wild card. They're probably not going to be as good, but does the difference between having a Chido Bayouzie and uh, improvement from Cam Taylor Britt offset the difference in safety? It could. So I think it's possible. I'll change that to I, I'm hoping that post bye week they play at a similar level to what the defensive backs played at last year. Yeah, I think anybody would take that. And I think from a national media side, when they look at the Cincinnati Bengals, it was so easy to pin to, to point at the offensive line for the last few years and say, that's why they're going to struggle. That's why they won't be the top of the AFC. Um, you know, that's why this team can't repeat. And then you look at the defense side of the ball and you're like, okay, well, they fixed the offensive line. Maybe, maybe Jonah Williams works out at right tackle. Then you go to Orlando Brown. We still don't know what it looks like with Orlando Brown at left tackle. I know he's not perfect, but I still feel like he's an upgrade. You have an okay offensive line, probably the best that Joe Burrow's had since he's been in Cincinnati. So you have to find something. You have to find something with this team when you look at it. And I think a lot of people, their easy reaction is, the safety position, their safety. They lost Von Bell. They lost Jesse Bates. They are going to struggle on the defensive side of the ball. They won't be the same. And I've said it again. We've said it this offseason on the podcast. When you have a guy like Lou Anarumo, I trust him with the secondary more than any position group that I could possibly think of on the defensive side of the ball. He's going to get the best that he can out of those guys. So I still have a lot of faith. We don't know what it's going to look like. I do think Nick Scott's going to start at safety and Dax Hill. Mm -hmm. And I really hope it works out for Dax Hill and, and Nick Scott too. Maybe it's a one-year thing with Nick Scott. And maybe after that, like mm, we saw it, it was okay. And, you know, Jordan Battle gets a few reps in and out of the, his rookie year. I still don't think Lou is going to put a rookie on the field if he doesn't feel confident in it. DJ Turner, I don't know. Maybe it's just a sit and watch. And then he's going to be Cheeto's replacement the following year. Or, you know, what, what the cornerback room looks like with Cam Taylor Britt and DJ Turner in 2024. We don't know. But I think personally, I have all the faith in the world that Luana Rumo will be able to help them. It's You're going to struggle. It almost reminds me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when you think of last year's offensive line and a lot of people wanted them. And we talked about the defense playing in preseason, you know, some of the safety, the cornerback, the secondary, getting those reps in, in those first two preseason games or maybe even one. I think about that conversation with the offensive line when it comes to communication and chemistry, that's important too on the other side of the ball. And maybe that's going to be important. And maybe that's, you know, a conversation that they're going to be having in about three to four weeks, what that looks like going into game one, game two, is it important to put Nick Scott out there? Will we see Jordan battle and some of the rookies um, getting some reps early on in those games? I, I think yes. And I feel, I don't know why I feel I'd rather have the secondary get reps more than the offensive line, but that's just where I'm at right now when it comes to that communication and that chemistry on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. It's something that I don't think we talk about enough uh, as a conglomerate, uh, not just us, but like everybody doesn't talk about yeah. enough is secondary communication. That's just about as important as offensive line communication. And they're talking just about as much as the offensive line talks to each other a little further away, but uh, they have to communicate with each other, hand signals and uh, well, also verbally. I think I am pro playing some of these guys in the preseason. I'm not, I don't think you feel that way, but I just think, I just think those live bullets and it's not 100%. It's not the exact same, but just being in that situation of an actual game, not having the safety fallback of its practice. Once you say the wrong word in a communication call or something, or you make the wrong signal, uh, 
whistle blows like no here it's a cloud we point at the sky whatever um i think once you can iron that out as fast as you can then it just comes down to the skill level and that's what i want to get to and i think that was a big reason why the offensive line struggled a lot early in the season they didn't they didn't have those reps they didn't communicate with each other i will say about dbs less contact so maybe a little less chance of getting hurt in the preseason than offensive line having to play. Although I'm also pro getting this offensive line of some snaps together in the preseason. I just, it's, I don't want Burrow taking snaps in the preseason. Then that's probably about it for the guys. That I'm like, I would probably at least play a series with everybody else. Just get them the live reps and the feel for what's happening. Like you don't need to play Hendrickson or Hubbard guys, you know, reader these, they don't have to really play in the preseason either, but with these groups, they're going to communicate a lot and they have new pieces. Those are the ones I, I kind of want to see a little bit in the preseason. And it's not for me to analyze it. It's just so that they get used to the communication with each other. So that could be a some that could be something like I was saying. It might not be that pretty early on. Similar to the offensive line last year, it was a great point to bring up. Offensive line last year, I still remember it was like week four, week five. You're getting the idea of like, when do we can Frank Pollock? I think mm-hmm. <laughs> I think the it might not be that bad uh, because there are three returning pieces. While the offensive line had one returning piece, uh, but I do think it's going to have those rough patches where what you're kind of looking around, like what just happened? Like nobody was near that guy. Get him ironed out before the playoffs, get him ironed out before the bye week really. And just hope that none of this is detrimental enough to lose you a game or anything like that, but get it, get it, get it all out of the way as quick as possible. Get the communication at a good groove Hopefully it's like a similar timeline for six weeks, somewhere in there. Uh, nothing longer than that. Mm-mm. I think this team can withstand some not awesome secondary play to start the year. And I'm not going to say it's going to be bad. I just think there's just going to be moments that make you think like what just happened over there. Um, yeah. I think good point to bring up uh, the two guys that I think are on the outside looking in, but have a chance to start mm-hmm. Jordan battle. And DJ Turner, who do you think is more likely to, without injury, start? Jordan Battle. I really do. And it's and maybe it's the off-season hype of the OTAs and the mini camp and just hearing, oh, Jordan Battle's out there with the defense. Let's see what, you know, the coaching staff is seeing. I just feel like he – and you've probably watched more Jordan Battle tape than, than I have. But, you know, hearing about him, reading about him, it's a big deal that when he was a freshman, he was starting on Nick Saban's Alabama team. And Nick mm-hmm. Saban focuses on the secondary group too. And I think that's telling. He's very physical, um, can be slow at times, but I still feel like that's the guy. And I don't want there to be injuries because I think it's awesome if Nick Scott works out because that's a great free agent signing. You want Dax Hill to work out in his first real season in the NFL. That's why you drafted him so high. So I I think it's going to be Jordan Battle. And I don't think it's – I think it's they're just going to change things up with their defense. What about you? Yeah, um, I think Lou Anarumo to me, and this is going to lead into uh, the last thing we're going to talk about, Lou Anarumo to me is such a chameleon on defense where he can change and do what he wants for any given week. He's a game plan defensive coordinator, especially I think that's why he's so good in the playoffs. He will bust out stuff he hasn't done before just for a matchup. Um, he'll change up what he did. He's not a guy like the old, oh, there's still a couple out there. I'm trying to think of the, the one's name, but like the Legion of Broom Seahawks guys, they all, they, they called that defense. Like that's what they wanted to run. That's what they're going to run. Um, Gus Bradley, so it's like Gus Bradley, still defensive coordinator and he's still doing that. I think even, um, some of the 49ers, Raheem Moore's or not Raheem Moore, Robert Sala, uh, he kind of also kept the we're gonna we're gonna kind of run what it what I run, uh, and it worked out well for him. But it, it is a different philosophy than what I see with Lou Anarumo and those other guys like Anarumo. But that's what I see with him is just when they play the Browns. I mean, 
they're not getting into that too high stuff. They're like they, they've got Nick Chubb, they've got a beef offensive line. We're gonna get down one high, rotate that safety down into the box, and we're gonna sell out for the run game. The real one that says it all was that Titans playoff game where I mean they're everything to stop Derrick Henry in that run game, and they gave up a couple passes, but they were they stopped the run game, and they knew that was important. Um, then you look to like what they do against the Chiefs, just two completely different things. When, when they played the Titans, they got into what's called a six, a, a tilt front, which is six, one, six beefy defensive linemen and one linebacker, and then four defensive backs against the chiefs. They got into dollar personnel. That is three defensive linemen and one linebacker and seven defensive backs. And that was on third and three. And they made the stop. So it's just, what can you ask out of a defense? Um, Lou Interman will do it. He does personnel coverage, blitz, not blitz. He does absolutely everything. And it's probably pretty demanding on the players to like know everything and be that good at everything. But he's been such a good coach and teacher that they are able to flawlessly execute all these different crazy game plans and whatnot. The one guy, it does remind <laughs> Okay, I don't even know what I said, but yeah, I mean, like it is what <sighs> I want to think of a lesser example, but it is what Bill Belichick used to do <laughs> when he faced guys like that. I'm not saying Lou Intermo is Bill Belichick, but same idea on Bill loves man coverage more than Lou does. But just when they get to the playoffs, they're going to game plan for their opponent. Mike Frabel, I guess, from the Belichick side of things, obviously, but Mike Vrabel, another guy that he's going to change things up for who he's playing against. Uh, that's true for the Bengals and Shane Bowen is their defensive coordinator. Who's done a good job. Whew, all that to say, I don't know what to expect out of the Bengals defense. And I just kind of expect everything because that's what they've done the past two years. It's, it's honestly crazy um, over wa watching them over the last two years. And when it comes to Louie and Arubo. I feel like for me, when it comes to the Kansas City Chiefs games, those will be the ones that they they stand out the most just because of that that January 2nd game when it was just a tale of two halves. And in the second half, it looked like Patrick Mahomes. I mean, you could even look at the AFC Championship game that in the second half he forgot the, how to play football because of Louie Rimmel. I mean, he was seeing ghost in the second half, and it was just unbelievable what he's able to do. The Bengals could be down by 28 points in the first half, and I'm like, hmm. They'll, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. They'll probably stop him in the second half because Lou Anarumo can do that. Um, it's it's He's so great, and I want to get to more of Lou Anarumo. We are going to re record another podcast this week, so we're going to dedicate another segment to him. But <laughs> if you were to look at just overall with Lou Anarumo outside of those Kansas City Chiefs games, you could even say the Titans game when they were able to stop Derrick Henry because that was the storyline going into that divisional game. Derrick Henry's back. How mm -hmm. will they stop Derrick Henry? And it was like, okay, well, Lou will show you. Is there a game of Lou Anarumo's that really you know stands out for you personally? I mean, the one that doesn't get enough credit for what it was is the Super Bowl. Did a great job against the Rams. They had no run game. And Stafford threw two picks. They were able to get him into some of those decisions. Yeah, Stafford and the, and the Rams offense, they made that final drive, went down the field and scored. But I think other than that, when you look at that game, low scoring, got a couple takeaways. Defense did everything they could to get the only thing I guess would be pressure. They didn't get enough pressure. And I guess you could say that about the chiefs game, but when you're looking at it and both those games, the offenses were pretty stifled. Uh, I'll take that. I'll take a little bit of the, well, you didn't get enough pressure. If that's my complaint, that's fine compared to, well, you gave up 30 points. <laughs> He doesn't do that. And he had a great game plan in that Super Bowl. He had his guys execute a great game plan in the Super Bowl. And it just, you know, it's upsetting that he is able to put all that out there. And then they didn't come away with the win because I thought the defense did enough. If somebody would have told me that the Rams would put up 23 points, I would, just, mm -hmm. I would have said, oh, the Bengals won 24-23. Or the Bengals won 27-23. Never yep. would have. You know what I mean? Yeah. I agree. There's 23 points in today's NFL. That's a great showing, especially against a good offense like that. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I mean, it just happened recently too in the AFC Championship game, 23-20. Um, no, it's absolutely, it's awesome. And and there's so much more to break down with Luna Ramon. We'll get to that in, in another segment because I know there was another ranking from our friends over at PFF, friends of the show. Um, so we'll get to that on tomorrow's. And then obviously uh, do the doubleheader mailbag. So send your questions, Bengals underscore Sands at LNDS Patterson. Still plenty to get to. Um, it's crazy to think, but the Cincinnati Bengals will report to training camp in about three weeks and two days, um, which will be really exciting and fun stuff to break down camp. And I can't wait to get to that. Um, as always, you're taking a little bit of a break over on All Bengals, but you still have content over there. Uh, if people need to go recap some of the rookies and, and just some of the offseason stories, make sure you check that out over on All Bengals. Follow him, Bengals underscore Sands. And thank you for listening to It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. <laughs>